We've been going with Israel out into the wilderness, but our point in doing this is we started, we started actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, realized there's five things that are mentioned about God's dealings with them. There's five lessons that the nation of Israel is to learn about who God is as he takes them out into the wilderness. And uh, they're, not, they're not learning the lesson, by the way. I hope you are. <laughs> So we, we'll move into the, uh, uh, actually, the, like the third lesson in uh, Exodus chapter 17. As we mentioned in singing the songs that we sung, Jim had the first two songs. It was about the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. And hopefully you'll see that this rock that we're going to read about here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 17, verse 1, it says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed, from the wilderness of sin, after they journeyed according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people chided with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore dost do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us up out of the land of Egypt to kill us with, and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, and uh, go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod, Wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee uh, there upon a rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come, out, come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the, of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do pray that as we study this passage that we don't just condemn the nation of Israel in the wilderness, but uh, we see the lesson you would have them to see and, uh, and learn the lesson that you would have us to learn about that spiritual rock that followed them, that rock being Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. You know, I sometimes, you know, years ago, of course, I think everybody does this. You just constantly, if you read through the book of Exodus, this murmuring against the Lord just constantly goes on, and you think, boy, don't the Israel ever learn their lesson. At the same time, when you get a little older, and especially as you're responsible first for a family, and then maybe a larger family as your family grows and all, if you would put yourself as the head of a household and you'd be out in the wilderness, and you've led your family, you said, no, we've got to follow Moses, this is what we need to do. And you go out in that wilderness, and you find no water, and you're now dying of thirst. And to think that you're just going to stay calm and collective, you don't see any, any, any water in sight, and no possible way to get water. Uh, put yourself in, in their shoes, and see if you would be faithful as you think you would be. But uh, I say that just so that you could picture yourself among them, looking at how many people there are, and if you could find just a little bit of water, how would you share that among so many, and would your family get what it needs, and you're also responsible for the cattle that you brought out there, and, and it would become a panic situation. But what we've been studying as we look at the nation of Israel going out in the wilderness, we actually have come to understand that God in his love and his wisdom led the nation of Israel into the wilderness. In fact, he, well, he could have led them a different way, but he led them this way. And he did that in his love and his wisdom. He led them into the wilderness where by, pro uh, where by proving them, they could learn their own in total inability. Now most of the, you know, we're talking about learn some things about God, but they're also learning some things about themselves, or at least they ought to be learning things about themselves, their total inability. That they could not and would not uh, walk in God's statutes, in his judgments, in his commandments. He's testing them before he ever gave them the Ten Commandments, and they failed every time. Uh, but that they would learn that about them, that they, that they had a sickness that, they had, uh, that needed to be healed that they weren't aware of. And that's where we saw back in the waters of Mira, Mara, that there he said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. 
But if they had the water to drink, the waters were healed, they didn't realize they had a problem that they did need healing from. And it was a heart problem, that their heart was willful and sinful, and, and they're not learning their lesson. Uh, but at the same time, them being brought into the wilderness, God proving them, showing them their inability, at the same time, God has taught them who he was, his name Jehovah, meaning their savior, their redeemer, their deliverer, that, that he redeemed them from bondage in Egypt by his power and by judgment. Uh, he, ha he who redeemed them himself was able to sustain them into that wilderness and, and that he was faithful by his word to supply them daily bread from heaven. And, uh, and so he's proving himself to them. There in that desert, they were helpless to do anything for themselves. They could not find water to drink, food to eat. Their life was totally in the hands of God. Uh, they had to trust God for everything. And as you would hopefully know, that with God is everything. Without God is nothing. And, uh, but God is proving them there. Now, as we, come, as we proceed along and they leave from the waters of Mirah, then they, they went on and God fed them bread from heaven, we come to Exodus chapter 17 and again in verse 1 it says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured, well, no they didn't, <laughs> journeyed in the wilderness of sin after their journey according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. So they're now in another place and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people chided with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? So the first thing you see as they go to this new place, again there's no water, but this time the people are said they're chiding with Moses. Uh, instead of at this point, you know, they've already seen God supply water once already. This, there's a similarity and, and yet there's a difference. We'll talk about that difference next week. But uh, they were without water, and he gave them water, and then they needed food, and he gave them manna from heaven. Now they go to Riffenden, and there's no more water, and they chide again with, Mo with Moses. And you would think that about at this time, rather than chiding with Moses, rather than murmuring against God, rather than tempting God, as it says here, that these people would now be anxious and say, boy, we're in a new place, God has been providing all along, I'm anxious to see what he's going to do this time. And, uh, and that hopefully would have been the case, but it, it wasn't the case. Instead, they murmur again, and, but they murmur in a harder way where it says in verse 2, and the people chided with Moses. Now, we, we've pointed out last week that every, their murmuring seems to be progressive. If you just quickly just kind of flip back to chapter 15 in verse 24. No, verse, yeah, verse 24, it says, And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what, uh, what shall we drink? Now, that's a question mark. You see that? And, but they're murmuring against Moses. When you get over to chapter 16, and they didn't have anything to eat, it says in verse 3, And the, and the children of Israel said unto, unto them, And the children of Israel said unto them, Moses and Aaron, Would to God we had died in, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. <laughs> uh, it's one thing is murmuring. Now they're actually, actually saying they wish they had died by the hand of God in Egypt. But then when you get over here in, in chapter 17 in verse 2, wherefore the people chided with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Period. So you went from murmuring and questioning to complaining and wishing you had died in Egypt to now chiding with Moses and demanding of Moses. So there seems to be an increase in their boldness and in their unfaithfulness to God. And, uh, and they chided and demanding of Moses. Uh, it, the word chide, chide, chiding means to contend, but to contend as with an adversary. Rather than looking at Moses as their leader, now they're chiding with him as if he's the enemy. And you get that from in verse 3, when it says, or, yeah, in verse 3 says, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of, uh, out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? 
So they're not looking at his Moses as their leader, someone leading them to the promised land. They're looking at him as an adversary and they're striving with him. They're, they're complaining and the complaining is becoming more forcible, more demanding. And when it says that they chided and it's like an enemy, look, look at verse 4. It says, And Moses said unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do un, uh, unto this people? For they be almost ready to stone me. So you see, they are complaining stronger and more forcibly. And Moses is looking at this as, there's going to be a mutiny here. They're going to kill me. And he's calling on God, actually, fear of the people, what they're doing in all this demanding, this chiding with him. So they're, they're increasing in their attacks against Moses, even to the point where Moses said back there in verse 2, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Well, when it was manna from heaven, we, we saw the fact that Moses said to them, Ye do, you're not murmuring against me, you're murmuring against the Lord. And we kept reading over there in chapter 16, where the Lord reminded about three different times, they're murmuring against me, they're, they're murmuring against me. They, they weren't really murmuring against Moses, it's God who sent Moses there to lead them out. And, and they're, they're murmuring, God says, I hear their murmurings, what they say about me or against me. So that they, they go from murmuring not just against Moses but against God. But now it's at a point where it says they're tempt. The Moses says, wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And when you go from murmuring to tempting, you've gone to a dangerous place. Tempting the Lord is something dangerous in your Bible. It's one thing we've, we've seen in both in chapter 15 and chapter 16 that the Lord led the nation of Israel out that he might prove them whether they will walk in his laws or not. And, and that's why I did the introduction. That's, God brought them out there. He brought them into the wilderness to prove them, to show them that they won't. But that he will supply. He is the faithful God. And that he is their deliverer and their sustainer. And the one who is faithful to his word, they need to look at the one, him as the one who is able, the one who is faithful, because they're not. But so, so he's out there proving them. It's one thing for God to prove them. It's another thing for them now to test God or tempt God or prove God. And, that, and that's what they're doing. They're now tempting God. Uh, look, when we say tempt God, look at uh, verse 7, that closing verse. It says, and, he, and Moses is going to call the name of that place Massa and Meribah. Now, he's going, those two names, they mean like, like the last thing, Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel. But Massa means, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now you, get, you start getting the idea what it means to tempt the Lord. It's, they're demanding that God prove himself to them. See if, if God's going to keep their commandments or no. <laughs> that's, what they're, that's what's going on here. And, and so things have progressed to a pretty dangerous spot that when you tempt the God, the Lord, it's dangerous. Now, the Lord is still dealing with them graciously because he's teaching them at this point. Later on, and I told you we weren't going to study it, but I want to show it to you now. Come to Numbers chapter 20, 21. And I'm actually showing you this so that when we read Psalm 78, you'll understand what Psalm 78 is saying because it's going to refer to both places. Numbers 21 and verse 5 it says, and, and by the way, this is, this is now the end of the 40 years. This is a lot later in, in, their, in God's dealings with them. It says, it says in verse 5 of Numbers 21, it says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Now that's their attitude toward the manna, that they've been eating for 40 years. Now in one sense, if you ate the same meal for 40 years... You better not judge them until you consider that yourself. But at the same time, to loathe means, it, it means to them it was disgusting. They're, they're sick of this. And it says in verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, uh, and they bit the people, and much people died, uh, much pe uh, of the people of Israel died. 
My point to you is they're tempting the Lord and they're getting into a dangerous place because later when they tempt the Lord, God's going to judge them and they're going to die. And so it becomes a very dangerous thing to tempt the Lord. Come over with me to Psalm 78 where the psalmist is going to take them back to these experiences and make sure Israel learned the lesson they were supposed to learn. It says, Psalm 78, back, let's start in verse 5, so that you can realize what they were supposed to be doing years later. Now, the, you know, Psalms was written, uh, David and those who ministered with David, and, and so, you know, you're talking about years later, after they're in the land, a kingdom had been established. It says it, it, that, that they're to teach things to their children. It says in verse 5, For he established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded, uh, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who would who should rise and declare them to their children. So you got children passing it down to children, generation after generation. The things that God was teaching Israel in the wilderness, recorded by Moses in Scripture, they are to make sure the generations down the way know these things. It's a good reminder to what's supposed to be going on in our families, isn't it? That we teach our children the things that God has given us in, in the age of grace. And that we raise up children who will know these things and pass them down to their children. But verse 7 says that they might set their hope in the Lord and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. That he might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with God. <laughs> we don't want children that way. And that there was generations in Israel that came up that way. And, and so we're to teach the children so they don't grow up that way. Over in verse 11. It says, uh, And forgot the works and his wonders that he had shown them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt and in the land of Zon. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand up as a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and at night with a light of fire. He clave the rock in the wilderness and gave them drink out of great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. I'll probably say this again next week because it became clear to me. Remember how we've been talking about the nation of Israel and like 2 million, maybe 3 million people? How many, what, what did we say, 11,000 gallons of water a day it would take to, to supply for these people and their cattle? And you start thinking of that much, and sometimes you think about the rock in Horeb, and, and if you know what happened there, Moses strikes the rock and water comes out to feed the people. Well, you know, in your mind you think, okay, there's a rock there, and a little trickle of water comes out of that rock. <laughs> well, if there's a little trickle of water coming out of that rock, how long do you think before two or three million people had a glass of water? <laughs> it's going to take a long time. Then you're going to feed their cattle? Well, it didn't come out that way. Look at that. He, he says, he clave the rock in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. That, you know, that's what happened in the days of, of Noah and the flood. The ground just gave out and water gushed. It says, he brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. <laughs> Notice that's plural. <laughs> that's a lot of water gushing out of this rock. And it's enough to supply for the nation of Israel. Anyhow, verse 17 it says, And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat to their lust. And that's why we read Numbers 21, where they, they started complaining that they didn't have, they were not only they were out of water, but they were tired of that light bread. They were tired of manna. They wanted something different. They wanted quail. And God judged them by giving them quail, by the way. Verse 19 says, And they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock, 
and the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed? Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for the people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth, and, and a fire was kindled against Jacob, and the anger of the Lord came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Whew. <laughs> That, that's what I mean. When Moses says, why tempt ye the Lord? You've gone from murmuring against God to tempting God, saying, is he among us or not? Can he do this or can't he? And, and when you read about when God finally wasn't going to put up with it anymore, and it's going to be later because God's patient in his judgment, that he judged and Israel died because they tempted him. So tempting the Lord is a very dangerous thing to do. Um, uh, come over to Matthew chapter 4. We saw in the temptation of Christ where Satan is tempting Christ to sin. Not that Christ was tempted to sin. He passed all the temptations of Satan. By the way, Satan is called the tempter. Uh, but that in, in when he was hungry after 40 days of not eating, the first thing that Satan said to him, Take this bread and turn it in. Uh, take the stone and turn it into bread. And the Lord says, "No, we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, not out of the mouth of Satan, not out of our own mouth, not only out, out of our desires. We do what God said. If God told me to, I would. I'm not doing it just because you tell me to." But then Satan does the next thing in, in Matthew chapter four and verse five. It says, "The devil taketh him up into a, a hole into the holy city." holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of, a tem of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, notice that if. Now, Satan knows who he is, and Jesus Christ knows who he is in the sense that, that in his deity he always existed, but there even in his humanity he's testing to see if Jesus Christ will test to see if he's the Son of God by doing what Satan said. He's actually tempting Christ. He says, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, thou shall give, He shall give his angels ch uh, charge concerning thee, and in thy hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thy dash thy foot against the stone. That quotation is a quotation about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and that's nobody will hurt Jesus Christ in his second coming. But it's not about the first coming of Christ. Jesus Christ rightly divided the word of truth. So that when Satan uses the scripture out of context, out of the dispensational setting of it, and try to get Jesus Christ to tempt, him, tempt God to prove, have God proved to him that he is indeed the Son of God, it says in verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus Christ wasn't tempted to cause God the Father to prove himself by using that verse out of context. And, uh, but you get the idea of what it means to tempt God. And by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ is quoting Deuteronomy 6.16 there about doing that. You, you remember when Ananias and Sapphira tried to say they sold all their possessions and were joining in with the believing remnant of Israel, waiting for the kingdom that was at hand to come? And, and what Peter said to Sapphira when she showed up to verify that her husband and her gave everything they had, he said, why tempt ye to hold a ghost? And you know what happened to her? She died like her husband did, trying to join the believing remnant when they weren't believers. And it's dangerous to tempt the Lord thy God. Uh, when uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul warns us to use Israel as an example, and he goes back to that Numbers 21 to warn us not to tempt the Lord. And later on in that passage, he said, do we provoke the God to jealousy? And when you get, some people, I've tried to point this out to people, jealousy doesn't make, like, to make God jealous doesn't mean we're going to make God go after us and show us more favor so that he can prove he loves us. That's to tempt the God and have judgment fall on you. When, when the God told Israel that he is a jealous God, if they bow down to another graven image, he's going to judge them. So it's not good to make God uh, jealous. So just Paul warns, just, just the, that, that, that idea about tempting God, we're not to tempt God. To tempt God is to, to try to make God prove himself to you by you demanding him to do according to your word, <laughs> for you to approve of him. 
Now that's the exact opposite of what walking by faith is. Walking by faith is God proving us where he told us things that we should do and by faith we do what God said to do. That's walking by faith. Tempting God is us demanding God to do what we said so that we could prove him and approve of him. And, and God's not about to uh, turn to us for our approval of him. Look, you're in Matthew. Come to Matthew chapter 12. And, and I just tell you, read Matthew's, Matthew chapter 9 through, actually just 9 and 10. I believe in nine, chapters 9 and 10, there's 10 miracles that Jesus Christ did. He does another miracle here in Matthew chapter 12 that they actually accused him of being Beelzebub, the prince of devils, that is, his enemies did. And when he deals with them and stumps them that he's not Beelzebub because, it's, uh, because of what he is doing is, is, not, is against the kingdom of the devil, not for the kingdom of Satan. Then it says, in verse 38, it says, Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. <laughs> He's been giving them signs. Because he told them, these signs, this is how you're going to know who I am. He's been giving them signs. They won't believe those signs. Oh, that's of the devil. Then he stumps them, so they turn around and say, well, give us a sign. And look what he says. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he talks about, as Jonah was in the whale three days and three nights, the Son of Man's going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The sign he's going to give them, when I get out of that grave, you're going to know who I am. And, and so he, he doesn't satisfy them, he just tells them the next thing that he's going to do according to the scriptures, and that's going to be the sign to them. But they're demanding a sign. Come over to chapter 22. In verse 15, it, it says, And the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonder, wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were, dis, they were displeased. I'm not in chapter 22, am I? 22, verse 15. <laughs> Are you in the right place? 22, 15. It says, Then the Pharisees took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out to him their disciples with the Herodians, so that's the political group, saying, Master, so you got a religious and political group together. They usually don't get along. We know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the persons of men. Okay, you don't take bribes, you don't care prestige. You know, when someone says a lot of nice things about you, you better be careful. I've learned that to be true. <laughs> you don't have to say nice things about me. I'll, I'll, I'll put you in suspicion. <laughs> so anyhow, they come to Christ, buttering them up. It says, Tell us, what, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or no? Now, the political group's going to say, You better pay your taxes. Or there's some, you're, you're disobeying the government. The religious group, why would you give your money to Caesar? You've got to give your money to God, right? So, verse 18, it says, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? So, that was just a temptation. He solved it by telling them something that just baffled them. He said, Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny, and he said unto them, Whose image and superscription? Now, you know whose image is on the coin? Caesar. And you know what it said? Son of Caesar divine. They, they worship Caesar. He claimed like he's a god. So they got a coin that's declaring Caesar is divine. And, and, they, and they said unto him, Caesar. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's but unto God, the things that are God. The coin was stamped with the image of Caesar. You and I were created in the image of God. Render to Caesar the things, take that coin, give it to Caesar. He made it, it belongs to him. You belong to God. Render to the things that belong to God. And, uh, boy, 
And when they heard the, these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. <laughs> You're not going to stump this man. So anyhow, but you see tempting the Lord. My, my whole point in, in talking about tempting the Lord there, there's two things that go on in the world today. There's this word of faith movement that you declare it and it will be done. That's not walking by faith. Walking by faith is reading what God declared and you walking by faith in what he said to us. The word of faith is as if you got the power, you say it, and then God's got to do it because you demanded it. Then you got the other, you got whole gobs of people going all over the place seeking to see a sign from God. When God gave signs to prove what was already written in the scriptures, the scriptures are complete. And to continue to seek a sign from God rather than to believe the things that God said is actually to tempt God. I need God to prove himself. He gave me a Bible. Yeah, I read all that. But I want, it to, I want him to show me. I want him to prove that he's alive, that he's real. And a lot of times it's prove that to, he's going to fulfill something that's out of the dispensational setting that we're living in. That is, what he promised to do for Israel is not what he promised to do for you and me. But everybody, I mean, people are flocking to see a sign. That's tempting the Lord. That's dangerous. They just need to believe what God said. And that's what Israel needed to do in the wilderness. Now, back there, we got a couple, three things we've got to get out today yet. Exodus chapter uh, 17. So in verse 5, when Moses cries to the Lord, looking for a solution, the Lord's going to give him the solution. In verses 5, 6, there, uh, what, what Moses is to do. And it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thy hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and, uh, that thou, uh, and, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out water, there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, as you look at this, God is going to tell Moses in, in the solution here, go, he's going to take, tell him to take, and then come to that rock in Horeb. So, those three things, when Moses was told to go, he is supposed to go, that is, go to the people, take of the elders, and then go to Mount Horeb there, or go to the rock in Horeb. And then he says that he is to take two things. And I think it's significant for us to see those two things. The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod. So when Moses goes to this rock in Horeb, he's got to be taking with him the elders of Israel and thy rod. Now, I, it's, it's important, especially in later on, the next event that's going to take place in Exodus 17, we'll cover that in two weeks from now, but that, that you understand something about what's going on, especially with the elders of Israel. Sometimes we just read things over, and it's right there in front of us, and we're not seeing it. Come over to Exodus chapter, thir uh, chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and we'll start back up in verse 13, because this is where we were saying that God's making his name known. Now, Moses is not, he's in the wilderness at this point. God's calling him to go back to Egypt. But he's given, the, given him these instructions, and uh, beginning in verse 13, it says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and they say unto, and I say unto them, the God of our fathers hath sent me unto you. They shall say to me, What is his name? And what shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Uh, uh, I am that I am. And he saith, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, 
the Lord of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. Uh, this, uh, this is my name forever, and this is, a, uh, is, is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of the children of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I shall surely visit you, I, and, uh, and seen that, uh, that which is done to you in Egypt, and I, have, uh, and, and I have said, I will bring you up uh, out of the affliction of Egypt unto a land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amor uh, the Am Amorites, the Prezites, the Hiv Hivites, the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey, and thou shalt hearken unto the voice, and they shall hearken unto thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath, hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Now that's my point to you is. Do you realize there's already an established leadership in Israel? Moses is told to go when he gets to Egypt, gather the elders, and what God said to tell the nation of Israel, you tell that to the elders, and when you go before, before, you, go, before, you, when you go before Pharaoh, take you, Aaron, and the elders of the nation of Israel. So there was a leadership, even in their captivity, in the nation of Israel, these elders in the nation of Israel. In chapter 4, in verse 29, it says, And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel, and Aaron spake all the words which the Lord has spoken unto Moses. Aaron's the spokesman. Moses is the one who gets the revelation from God. And it says, And did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that, they had, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Notice he gathers the... Like, think about it. We, we've been talking about the vast number of the nation of Israel, even how many acreage when they would set up camp. And then God would say, Moses, go tell Israel. How did he tell Israel? He didn't have a megaphone, <laughs> maybe he had a megaphone, but he certainly didn't have a PA system. He didn't send them a text message and they all checked their phones, oh, look what Moses said now. I mean, how did he communicate to two million, three million people? Well, he takes the elders and he communicates the truth to the elders. The elders take that information to the people that they represent and, and everybody in the nation of Israel gets the message. There is not only a leadership in the nation of Israel, there's a communication system to the nation of Israel, and those elders are the way that Moses communicated to that nation of Israel. Now, come over to chapter 12. In verse 21. It says, And Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw you out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. My point is, we studied the Passover. How did that word get out one day to all them people? <laughs> he, taught, he gave the instruction to the elders. Boom, they go out and tell the people. It spreads fast. But at the same time, since there is an eldership in the nation of Israel, those elders were the ones communicating the word of God that God gave to Moses, and Aaron speaks for Moses, and then they take that message to the people. But at the same time, when these people are murmuring against Moses, they're murmuring back through their elders. The elders are making decisions for the nation. The elders are the voice of the people, who are the heads of the people making decisions for the nation. And that's how the nation of Israel is established. That's an important thing to realize here, is that it's not just, we're not talking about every individual, but the elders are speaking for the nation, and, and they are the representation of that nation. So Moses is supposed to go and take the elders with him. They're going to see what's going to happen here and how God's going to supply and communicate that to the people. But the other thing he's supposed to take, he says, and thy rod. And he didn't just say thy rod, he said, the rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Now, that rod, that, again, the, the next thing that we're going to read in this book is you need to have an understanding of the rod. So go, go back with me again to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 
Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thy hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the, uh, on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thy hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. So God said, take thy rod. The first time that rod shows up, it's just a rod. But all of a sudden, by the word of God, it was more than a rod, isn't it? Look over in chapter 4 and verse 20. When Moses now is going to go to Egypt and do what God said, it says, And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to... The Am I in the wrong verse? <laughs> Let's not say what I thought I was going to say. Wait a minute. 4, verse 20. Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on the ass and returned to the land of Egypt. Oh, there it is. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. So thy rod, which was a rod, has now become the rod of God in the hand of Moses. And and. What you need, all you need to do now is, and I'll just speak these things because we don't have time to go through each one, but Moses is going to take that rod, and you know what happens when him and Aaron go before Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh says, why would I let my, your people go? And he says, I, I, show me a sign, show me a miracle. Aaron takes Moses' rod, casts it down, becomes a serpent. Pharaoh orders the magicians, you cast your rod down, they cast it down, and they also became serpents. But you know what happened, don't you? Moses' rod swallowed up all their rods. <laughs> they didn't get their rod back. Moses got his rod back. <laughs> so that rod became a sign there that God's more powerful than the magicians of Egypt and, uh, and that Moses is the one that God is speaking through. So it becomes a sign. And by the way, that's the first of the signs in your Bible that shows the, the word of God. But Moses, when he took that rod, it said, The rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Well, come with me to Exodus chapter 7 and verse 19. This is after he goes to Pharaoh. It says, and, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch forth thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon the streams, upon the rivers, and upon the ponds, and upon all the pools of water, that they may become blood. And there, that they may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both vessels of wood and vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, and it happened. He took that rod and, and turned all the fresh water in Egypt into blood because of the rod of God in his hands. Uh, when, and then that just continues over chapter 8 and verse 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, uh, Say to Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams of the rivers and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come out of the, of the river. And he does. Verse 16, The Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it might become, uh, uh, become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And it does. And in chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, And Moses stretched forth his hand over Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind uh, upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought locusts. Um, so uh, it says Moses stretched forth not his hand, but his rod over, over Egypt. So you begin to see that the rod that he's talking about, take that rod wherewith thou smotest the river. It brought curse, it brought death, it brought judgment, did it not? So that the rod of God is the rod of God's power of his judgment and his chastening. So, people need water, Moses? Go, take those elders, take thy rod, go to that rock in Horeb. Now that rock, that's the one, I don't need to take you there, if you need to write it down, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4 where the Apostle Paul, looking back at Israel, said they all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, 
there's something really unique. When I started looking at that, I, I knew I you know, was excited to show you that this is a picture of Jesus Christ, that, that Jesus Christ is the rock. But what, what I never realized before is, you know, that's the first time, Exodus chapter um, 17, and was it verse 6 there? That is the first time the word rock appears in your Bible. I thought, that doesn't sound right. I thought, how, how could that be the first time? Because the Bible talks all about, you know, rocks, you know, Moses, uh, uh, the different altars that were built. You go back in, er, before all this in Genesis, you know what the word was always? Stone. There, there's a difference between a rock and a stone. Right, right from the Bi beginning of the Bible, you begin to see this, that a rock, as it's being talked about here, is something mountainous. That's why I almost call it the mountain. <laughs> it, 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 the rock that he's going to, I mean, for all that water to rush out, this is, this is huge. It's, it's mountainous. It, it's, this rock is strong. This rock is foundational. It's a refuge. The next time you find rock in, in the Bible is when God's going to show Moses' glory, and he hides Moses in the cleft of the rock. A refuge where a rock can, can save them. And, and so that's what a rock. When you read about a stone back in Genesis, it first shows up as like currency, a precious stone, jewels like. But then it's always a place where people take stones to build something. And, and so they're, they're taking stones to be able to build, to gather and to build something out of it. Our, Sunday, our Wednesday lesson, we're studying the book of Galatians, and we, we're wondering why in Galatians that where the Apostle Paul, he'll be talking about Peter, and then he says, when James, Cephas, and John. Paul's the only one that refers to Peter as Cephas. And we, so we looked at, I say the only one except for Jesus Christ, in John chapter 1 and verse 42, when, when the Lord Jesus first met Peter, his name is Simon, he's called Peter, but his name is Simon, and Jesus says, thou, thou art Simon, thou shalt be called Cephas, and then John tells us, which by interpretation is a stone. Cephas is the Aramaic for stone. Peter, that most of the time is used, is, is Peter's name is, Petros means stone. Now come with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now perhaps I'll, I'll take you next week because I need to point out two, two things here and I'm going to do it kind of quickly. Deuteronomy, we'll read the verses next week where it keeps talking about a capital R. Israel's rock. And it's always a capital R in references, reference to God. The Gentiles, they worshipped a rock, didn't they? It has a small r because they worshipped stones. They worshipped rocks. But the living rock is God. He's not just a rock. The idols the Gentiles worship, they're actually rocks. <laughs> but Israel's rock was God. In fact, when you go Psalm 17, it's, uh, Psalms, in the book of Psalms, the psalmist will refer to God is our rock some 17 times. Ten times throughout the Bible, the Bible will refer to the rock of our salvation. It's a reference to God. Always a reference to God. So when you come to Matthew chapter 16 here, it says in verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say, I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Who am I? And Simon Peter, notice those two names, answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Son of God. You're God made human flesh and dwelling amongst us. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Now why, you know, Bar-Jonah, that means son of Jonah. He just said, You're Jesus, the Son of the living God. The Lord said, you're Simon, son of Jonah. They're, he's playing back and forth on the names, right? He said, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, you're a stone. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, there's a religion that makes that rock Peter, and makes him the foundation 
of salvation in their church. Peter's a stone. The rock that Israel always recognizes as being their rock is God. The rock is a reference that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the kingdom church in the early days of Pentecost, it, the believing remnant of Israel are those who recognize who Jesus Christ is, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's believing on that that they're going to be His called out people in Israel. So the rock is not Peter. Paul says, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now let's close with Romans chapter 9. God later, when Israel would not recognize who Jesus Christ was, that rather than bringing judgment to this world, God started the eight, interrupted Israel's program, began the age of grace, sent Paul out, and in the age of grace, Gentiles who never sought God, who never tried to be righteous with God, end up receiving salvation as a free gift by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So verse 31, it says in John, in Matt, do I got you in Romans 9? Romans 9, 31. It says, but Israel, it says, oh, verse 30 it says, but what, uh, what shall we then say, say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness hath obtained unto the righteousness, unto righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. You believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the payment for your sin, God declares you righteous. Gentiles, we're lazy. Oh, I'll do that. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, I'll do it myself, hath not obtained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a what? And rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now you know we've got to continue with this next week. Because what did Moses do with that rod of God's judgment? He smit the rock. The rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what brought water to the nation of Israel? What brought salvation physically for the nation of Israel in the wilderness? The smitten rock brought about their salvation. A picture of a personal rock that's going to come to the nation of Israel who is going to be smitten on the cross. And because he was smitten on the cross, he can give them the water of life freely. That's a good lesson for next week, isn't it? Come back next week, but if you don't come back, you've just heard what brings real life. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, and not just who he is, but the fact that he was smitten with the judgment of God that out from him can pour life everlasting. If you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can see this Bible is a miraculous book. It has spiritual lessons, physical things that are back here in the Old Testament that are pictures of spiritual lessons in here of the Lord Jesus Christ that is offered to us Gentiles freely. <laughs> Israel kept trying it through the law, give up trying to be religious with God. Trust the finished work of Jesus Christ and be saved. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the opportunity of studying your Bible and seeing these marvelous things out of your word and pray that we learn the lesson that Israel's failing to get and how that everything rests on you and not on us. It's in your name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we pray. Amen. And sing our chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon the Rock, I mean, upon Jesus. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and 
you are dismissed.